When Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was assassinated by Serbians in June 1914, Little New Zealand probably thought nothing of it. The likely thoughts at the time were that it would be sorted out amongst a few involved countries. As it happens, one year later New Zealand was itself tangled up in what would become a five-year war that involved 30 countries and ended 16.6 million lives. When New Zealand's involvement in the Great War is recounted, the conflict that rises to the top both in world importance and significance to us as a country is the Gallipoli Campaign of 1915. But where does the Battle of Passchendaele fit into the New Zealand war story? New Zealand was more than a one-trip pony in the war, and the Battle of Passchendaele was arguably just as costly battle as Gallipoli was. Gallipoli has become almost the sole focus of our thoughts of World War I and our remembrance of it. It is taught in schools, it is the focus of our War Remembrance Day, and when most New Zealanders are asked about World War I, Gallipoli is the first thing that comes to mind. What most New Zealanders failed to recognise is that Gallipoli was not, in fact, the most costly battle for New Zealand during the war. The Battle of Passchendaele in 1917 cost us almost twice as many lives as Gallipoli did. The question then remains to be asked and answered. Why don't we remember the Battle of Passchendaele? The first Battle of Passchendaele occurred in October 1917, just west of the village of Passchendaele, located in the Ypres salient in Belgium. The battle itself was one of the eight separate battles of the Third Battle of Ypres, a campaign between the British Army and her allies and the German forces from June 1917 till February the following year. The campaign was the idea of General Sir Douglas Haig, with the aim of capturing control of bridges to the east and south of the Belgian city Ypres. Haig's offensive action in Ypres was controversial and not fully supported, least of all by Prime Minister Lloyd George, but it was eventually given the go-ahead. From June 7, 1917, British and French forces began a number of separate attacks to attempt to push back the German line and claim the Ypres ridges for the Allies. One of these subsequent battles was the First Battle of Passchendaele, which occurred on October 12, 1917. It was here that New Zealand would see its most costly day in its recent military history. By October of 1917, General Haig was attempting to capture the Passchendaele Ridge, one of the ridges that was to the northeast of Ypres. Haig's plan was to push back the German line near Pol Capel, another village to the west of Passchendaele. Haig's thoughts were that by pushing the German forces back at Pol Capel on October 9th, he would significantly weaken his enemy, so much so that a final push could be launched towards capturing the Passchendaele village and the ridge a few days later. The Battle of Pol Capel did not go well for the Allies, with the German barbed wire and superior artillery and machine guns holding up strong against the advancing British and French troops. Unfortunately, misleading information of the battle got back to Field Marshal Herbert Plumer, who in turn passed on to Haig that Pol Capel had been a success and sufficiently good jumping off line had been attained for the attack on October 12th. This erroneous mistake proved to be costly for the Allied forces who were now preparing to attack what they thought was a weakened German line at Passchendaele. Instead, they were about to walk into a self-administered trap. The preparation by the Allies for the October 12th attack was terrible, with many of the Allied supporting artillery units unable to be shifted in the short amount of time after Pol Capel. This was because they were stuck in the immense bog that had been created as a result of three months of driving rain in Belgium and heavy German shell fire had destroyed the drainage pipes in the area, meaning that the surrounding fields simply became mud and water. Because of this, the Allied bombardment was significantly weakened for their attack. To make matters worse, the German lines that were supposedly fragile from the Battle of Pol Capel three days earlier were practically undamaged. In the early hours of the 12th of October, the New Zealand forces advanced towards Passchendaele, they expected their way to be unimpeded, but they were blocked by a line of German barbed wire that was believed to have been destroyed in the previous artillery attack. A number of brave soldiers tried to fight through the wire, but they were easily gunned down as they attempted to struggle through the line. The barbed wire was impossible to pass, and the New Zealanders began to be fired upon by German machine guns from the front and the flank. Retreat was not an option. But with no way forward, the New Zealanders were pinned down with nowhere to go.
Taking cover in between the lines was no easy feat, however, with the German gunners able to pick off the New Zealanders with almost no resistance. In this single day's fighting, there were more than 2,700 New Zealand casualties. 45 officers and 800 men were either dead or lying mortally wounded in the mud and bog. This was to be the darkest day in New Zealand military history, with the greatest number of lives lost in a single day in any conflict that our forces have been involved in. The New Zealand involvement in Ypres did not stop with the catastrophe at Passchendaele, however. By the time the Ypres campaign was completely finished in February 1918, over 5,000 New Zealand soldiers had lost their lives in various battles, with some 13,000 others wounded. The First Battle of Passchendaele was by far the worst of these, however, so bad in fact that the word Passchendaele is now a representative word for the Ypres campaign as a whole. Ypres was a failure, Passchendaele a monumental disaster, and New Zealand paid the price. When we compare the military toll on New Zealand forces in Ypres, including the Battle of Passchendaele, and Gallipoli, it is clear that the former was considerably more costly than Gallipoli was. Almost twice as many New Zealanders lost their lives in Flanders fields than on the slopes of Gallipoli, and the total casualty toll of 18,000 at Ypres completely swamps that of the 7,000 at Gallipoli. Why is the Battle of Passchendaele not remembered more then? Surely as our greatest ever military loss in a single battle, it should be our most remembered battle of the war. Well, the answer to this is really quite simple. The Gallipoli campaign was more significant to us as a country than Passchendaele, or even Ypres as a whole, was to New Zealand. As 1915 began, World War I had been going on for five months, and the trenches were dug for 350 miles from the North Sea to the Swiss Alps. The Allied leaders were unhappy with the lack of advance on the German forces, and so multiple leaders began to suggest alternate ways in which to break the stalemate and win the war. The leaders came to a consensus that a naval attack on the Dardanelles Strait along the Turkish coast was the best idea. Unfortunately for the Allies, their naval attack did not go to plan. On March 18, 1915, 16 British and French ships sailed up the straits and began to bombard the Turkish forts along the Narrows. The battle did not go well for the Allies, with three ships, Ocean, Bouvet and Irresistible, being sunk by mines, and another three, Inflexible, Galois and Suffren, being seriously damaged. With the naval attack unsuccessful, it was back to the drawing board for the Allied leaders. It was eventually decided that a land campaign was to occur at the Gallipoli Peninsula to weaken the Turkish forts in order that the navy could have a second attempt at forcing the straits, this time with the Turkish guns neutralised. With most of Britain and France's soldiers tied up on the Western Front, alternate avenues were needed to create the force required to win such a campaign at Gallipoli. New Zealand and Australian forces had been training in Cairo, Egypt, since December 1914, and were called upon to bolster the few British and French battalions that had been gathered. The Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, ANZAC, commanded by Lieutenant General William Birdwood, were thus called into action. The ANZACs were to play a key role in the landings, tasked with capturing the southern part of the Sari Bear Ridge, and moving across the peninsula to Maidos. The British and French troops were to make similar landings along the southern part of the peninsula, with the aim of moving north to sandwich the Turkish troops between themselves and the Anzacs. The Gallipoli landings occurred on the morning of April 25th, with the Anzac troops approaching their designated landing point in boats. Only by some accident, the Anzacs landed two kilometres further north than where they had planned. Some historians blame tidal changes, other inaccurate maps, but whatever the reason, this was a costly mistake with the terrain that the Anzacs faced being vastly different to what they had expected. Instead of the ideal gradual incline that had been picked out for their planned landing spot, they were instead faced with sheer hill faces that were very hard to progress up under heavy fire. To complement the unexpected conditions, there appeared to be no clear leadership during the landings. Soldiers were scattered all along the beach, coming under fire from the Turkish soldiers on the surrounding hills, with no clear direction or instruction of what to do. Unable to retreat, the New Zealand and Australian forces had no choice but to dig in and face the Turkish onslaught from the low ground. Over the next few months, the Anzacs and the Turks fought small skirmishes, with neither side being able to gain the upper hand. The Anzacs were in too weak a position to drive the Turks back up the hills to the peninsula, but neither were the Turks able to rout the Anzacs into retreating. 
Although they were in a terrible position strategically, the Anzacs showed great courage and fighting skill to hold their position under overwhelming fire from the Turks. It was in these days and weeks of fighting together side by side that the Anzac partnership was formed and cemented our two nations together as allies and brothers. During August, the Allies decided to take more offensive action to try and break the deadlock at Gallipoli. It was on August 6-9th that the New Zealand troops had their biggest involvement in the desperate attempt to break the Turks. With the summit of Chanak Bear as their goal, a number of New Zealand battalions fought their way up tabletop and rode Dundrum Spur under heavy fire. Showing great courage, the Wellington and Auckland battalions fought past the Turkish lines, losing many men in the process, and finally reached the summit of Chanak Bear in the early hours of August 8th. This was perhaps one of the few small victories of the Gallipoli campaign as a whole, with the different Australian and New Zealand regiments working together to get men to the top. The New Zealanders held Chanak Bear summit for two days. They desperately tried to hold their position, but a Turkish counter-attack on August 10th completely overwhelmed the small band of New Zealanders who were exhausted after fighting for nearly two days unaided. Gallipoli may have been a joint Anzac coming of age, but holding Chanak Bear was certainly a feat that New Zealand alone can claim. Of the whole campaign, this is where Kiwis proved their mettle the most. Historian Christopher Pugsley agrees. If New Zealanders have a day that is uniquely ours, it's 8 August 1915. The New Zealand Infantry Brigade was, for 48 hours, at the throat of the Turkish Empire, and had support been forthcoming at the right time and place, the Turkish army would have been beaten, Constantinople would have fallen, and the war might have been shortened by two years. The August offensive had been the last roll of the dice by the British commanders, and so it was decided that with the failure to control Chanak Bear, their Allied forces would be evacuated from Gallipoli. The disaster that was the Battle of Passchendaele in 1917 has been well and truly overshadowed by Gallipoli within our heritage and history for a number of reasons. Although Passchendaele was undeniably when New Zealand had its greatest military loss in terms of casualties, Gallipoli was arguably New Zealand's greatest military loss in terms of how significant and defining it was to our country, both at the time and in the generations to follow. Well, the real significance of Gallipoli to us as a country was not because of the military outcomes, but because of how symbolic it was for New Zealand. Gallipoli was our first real military effort on the world stage, where we picked a side and fought for what we believed in. At the time, Britain was considered as the motherland, in a World War I, we decided that we had to support them and fight alongside her troops. The campaign enhanced New Zealand's sense of itself within the British Empire. New Zealanders still identified strongly with that empire, but became more conscious of national characteristics that set them apart from British and other imperial troops, Ian McGibbon. The reason why the campaign was considered so significant at the time, and continues to be significant to our heritage and culture, was because it was where we found our nationality, and our first real sense of as a country, uniting together to fight and die for a cause. Ian McGibbon says in his Gallipoli book that It was here many believed that New Zealanders established a tradition which underpinned a developing sense of national identity. Ormond Burton said in 1915 The way the man died on Chanak is shaping the deeds yet to be done by the generation still unborn. When the August fighting died down, there was no longer any question but that New Zealanders had commenced to realise themselves. A nation. New Zealand and Australia have come to think of Gallipoli as the birthplace of a true sense of national identity that both countries wear with pride today. The fighting here bound our troops with loops of steel, as one officer wrote, and created an Anzac spirit that will never be broken. It is not that Passchendaele wasn't significant to us as a country. It is certainly an important battle within our World War efforts, but it simply didn't have the same impact that Gallipoli did in defining us as a nation or creating the Anzac Alliance. Many of the New Zealand soldiers that fought at Passchendaele had fought at Gallipoli in 1915, so there was less of a sense of New Zealand soldiers taking their first step onto the international stage within the Big Bad War. The terrible conditions and horrific experiences at Passchendaele should never be forgotten or minimised, but they will never be held in the same account as Gallipoli for the simple reason that the latter was where we first fought for an international cause. While we may not have lost as many lives at Gallipoli as we did at Passchendaele, 
Gallipoli was where a lasting legacy was created for our country that could not and will not ever be replicated. By 1917, the world was already well aware of the bravery of New Zealand and her soldiers because of what had transpired at Gallipoli in 1915. This is one of the key reasons why Gallipoli steals so much of the limelight and Passchendaele is not as well remembered. That Gallipoli was of course where we first found our ANZAC partnership with Australia, a partnership that has continued on to the current day. From those Australian and New Zealand divisions that fought to hold the hills together in 1915, we realised how similar we and the Australians were. Like us, they were finding their feet in unfamiliar territory, and some have suggested that together our two countries were baptised in blood at Gallipoli. The Anzac bond was just as strong at Passchendaele as it was anywhere else, but its creation was at the very heart of the Gallipoli landings. Unfortunately for Passchendaele, this is just another contributing factor to why it is not perhaps as remembered as it should be. Although Gallipoli was undeniably more significant to New Zealand because of how it established our national identity and the Anzac bond, Passchendaele, and indeed the other confrontations that we were involved in in the war, should not be forgotten or pushed to the back seat of the bus. In order to truly appreciate the immense effort of our soldiers within the war, it is crucial to remember every battle in which New Zealanders gave their lives to fight. The Battle of Passchendaele in 1917 was significant to New Zealand for its own reason, and should not have to live in the shadow of Gallipoli when it comes to remembering World War I. Passchendaele was where New Zealand bravery and courage shined its very brightest. There was no such glory of Gallipoli, and it was a disastrous loss in every way. But this is exactly why we should remember it. Passchendaele was an important piece within the New Zealand World War I puzzle, and should be given the recognition and remembrance that it deserves. In Flanders' fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row that mark our place and in the sky the lark still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields.